All right, so uh, tonight um, we're really fortunate to have uh, one of my assistant coaches uh, with us. He's been with me for three years, one year at the Redbacks and uh, obviously last year with the Wolves and, and then obviously this year as well in our pre-season. Um, he basically takes control of all my scouting for me um, and we've been fairly successful um, over the last, well, the time that we've been together. Um, so uh, he, does a, he does a fantastic job. Um, obviously a, a fairly long playing career at SBL level as well. Um, and um, a fantastic basketball mind, which uh, I love uh, um, working with. So um, I'll, I'll hand it over to Tim and he can take charge. All right, I'm on, unmuted. Um, yeah, obviously, thanks for the opportunity. I don't get to do things like this too often. And um, so it helps with my development as well. And, Hey, dividends, and obviously I get, I've learnt a lot from basketball over the years, so I get to um, help out anyone else who's trying to be in the same position as me or just interested in basketball. It doesn't matter. It's just, uh, it pays to help. So um, for anyone that doesn't know me, uh, my name's Tim Rendelik. As Nixie just touched on, I've been with him for, well, this year would have been the third season. Um, I've done about now five years as an assistant coach for the, in the WSBL. I was at Perth prior to coming to Joondalup in 2019. Um, prior to that, again, as, as he touched on, I played SBL for, I uh, played about 180 odd games uh, for Perth, the Perth Redbacks as well. Um, and prior to that, my entire life has pretty much been basketball since I was seven years old. I didn't play footy, I didn't venture off into other sports. I've always been infatuated with basketball so I've kind of it's been hard to escape not that I've wanted to but it's panned out all right um otherwise I'm like everyone else that's that's basically coaches I'm 35 years old I'm married I've got a four-year-old boy now um and I work a full-time job as an estimator for a building company so I'm just a normal person that enjoys enjoys basketball and helping other people out whether that's players or other coaches whoever it may be so any opportunity to give back is has been really good um, and Nixie obviously asked me to touch on some scouting stuff um, today to try and hopefully help everyone out. It'll probably be a little bit more um, geared a little bit towards how I would do stuff at the SBL level with Nixie. Um, but that's not to say you can't utilise or implement it at either a wobble level, um, domestic level if you really to, needed to. And then obviously if you start going to higher levels, then you're going to get different formats and um, concepts to scouting and how, how sort of in-depth you can go. Um, so starting, I broke it up into a couple of sections. I basically have, um, I'll just touch on really briefly, uh, what is scouting? Why would you, why do you scout? Um, what are your resources essentially for scouting? Um, and then sort of that'll sort of evolve into what to look for when you're scouting and then sort of touch that and break that up a little bit into player scouts, team scouts, intangibles. Um, how you can basically utilise and what you should do with that information from there. Uh, and then lastly, I've got a, I'll actually show you the spreadsheet that I use for scouting, which is week to week on a weekly basis for when we've got games at SBL. Um, and then I'm discussed with Nixon that hopefully he should be able to make that available um, for everyone to utilise if you want it and you can do whatever you want. And I'll actually run through and explain how you can tie that in. It's really simple, really straightforward. There's nothing rocket science about it, but then you can basically cut and change it to utilise it however you see fit um, if you choose to go down that route and utilise something like that. Um, so I guess firstly, more or less, what is scouting? Pretty simple, straightforward. Uh, it's essentially just a collation of information on the opposition team to basically either create a game plan where... That's the game plan you're going to utilise or you create basically a counter game plan. So that goes one of, one of two ways. Either you can design your game plan around implementing what you want in the game and making sure you, that team happens or you basically create a counter game plan where you know what the other team is going to be doing and you basically interact or modify your game plan to suit that in order to get an advantage. So how you choose to play that is entirely up to you and it may, may or may not affect how, how you want to go about doing the scout as well. Um, Scout information can be used typically to aid yeah, the existing one, sorry. Um, it's very simple in the fact that you can either be as light on or as in-depth, essentially, as you want. Um, scouting can be 
simply acknowledging that a team, how a team, one player plays, whether or not they're available, that's a form of scouting. If you know that information, you can use that to your advantage. Um, the numbers that a player might average right up to advanced stats where you start talking about um, true shooting percentage, effective field goal percentage, assist to turnover ratios or whatever, but it all depends on the information that's <clears throat> pardon me, actually available to you. So if you don't have numbers to those stats, you need to look at more intangible things like tendencies of a player and stuff like that. So understand what's available to you first and then you can make those assessments from there. Um, and then ultimately it's about just knowing how much or what information that your coach wants. If you're the head coach, then that's perfectly fine. You can obviously um, lead into it and get as much information as you deem fit. Otherwise, if you're, say, such as myself working with Nixie, I need to understand what it is that he actually wants. Um, and then once you have an idea of that, you can go, cool. If he says, I just want to know about the offensive side of a particular team or a player, cool, straight away, you know, that's where you can focus your attention to. If you change this from week to week, then you know what you're doing. And then I think everyone just gets on the same page and then you're utilising your time to the best of your ability um, if you're able to do that. Um, why do you scout? Essentially, uh, it's simply to give yourself, your team or your players, a competitive advantage. There's no other sort of reason or definition to it, but that is basically why you would do it. Um, and obviously, with different levels of basketball will come different levels of requirements and how far you need to go in terms of picking that up. Whereas a social, as I touched on before, social or domestic league, it could be as simple as knowing who, just simply knowing who's the best player on the team, how, how you're going to play against them. Is somebody missing from the opposition team? Cool, you can modify your game plan around that. Um, a wobble level, you start to get a bit more information thrown your way. So you've got, you've Obviously, you're pretty limited in the numbers aspect where you're sort of restricted to point players, what they're averaging in points per game, how many fouls they're getting, but you can still use that information. Is this player scoring a lot? Yes, okay, we know they're going to be their, perhaps their better players. In hindsight, that's how you would typically look at it. And then maybe you could look at the fouls, who plays defense, who gets fouled out a lot, who draws a lot of fouls. Maybe we'll look at attacking them, get them out the game, so on and so forth. Um, at an SBL level, again, it goes up again where you, could, you have a, more numbers to utilise. So you have all your other stats um, available to you. So as more than just your points and fouls, now you've got your assists, your rebounds, um, points for and against for your team aspect. So it starts giving you more information that you can delve into and utilise. Um, probably at that stage, you can start looking at more player tendencies, um, understanding game plans from opposition teams as well. What are they running? How do they like to play? Are they up-tempo? Are they slow? Do they play controlled? So you've got all that information that's getting thrown your way. And then again, if you go above that, you get NBL stuff where it gets really crazy where they basically be advanced stats. At, uh, like I mentioned before, they'd be talking about creating counters to what the actual team is playing um, and basically trying to preempt what they're actually going to do but on a more advanced level so I won't touch on that because I'm not even involved with that so we'll sort of just stick to what we know um, I guess what after that I was going to touch on the resources so what sort of resources do you have or need um, to be able to scout now I think the most important one in that aspect particularly if you're uh, dealing with the levels that we're all sort of coaching at it's more a case of um, the resourcefulness of that you have as opposed to your resources. So not everyone's going to have access to numbers or video footage uh, and stuff like that. So it can be something as simple as actually talking to people is probably something that you can utilise really well, particularly uh, at a wobble level because, I mean, unless the kids probably these days are not really filming their games unless they're thinking long-term and already trying to put packages together for... Um, college applications and stuff or highlight packages and stuff like that so whereas um, at an SBL peak they're filming the games you have all that stuff uh, access to so you need to sort of think about okay what what do I have to utilize and obviously probably the most important one for scouting if you can get it is obviously the video side of things um, it's basically the most the best source of in-depth detail and information that you can get it never it never lies Nixie will, is a very popular stickler for that one is saying that it never lies people players can't hide coaches can't hide you see exactly how it is without any sort of bias um, behind us and that's probably the most essential 
PC can get. So my advice would be if you have an opportunity, particularly at a wobble level, to film your games on how far you really want to invest yourself, I would record the games. So A, you start building up a catalogue of throughout the season of who you have played, how you have played, your tendencies and so forth. And you can utilise that to assess yourselves, obviously. But more importantly, if I'm talking about it in a scouting perspective, you now have an entire 40-minute game of a team that potentially you either might see it in the playoffs or you might play um, again later in the season, depending on your conferences and stuff like that, which is really important because then you can see how did you play them effectively the first time, what wasn't so effective, um, what are the adjustments you can make. And then if you really want to delve into it at that level, you can start basically, you might be able to show snippets to your players. Look, this wouldn't overload them with them, but... This is what we can improve on. This is what we did really well. This is what we might change next time we see this team. So um, that's really important. Now, you've, you've got home recordings. People put highlight videos together. Huddles, obviously, are a really, really big one. Um, and probably the main one at an SBL level that people utilise, um, which is basically, I'm sure, I'm assuming everyone knows, but otherwise it's just like an online portal where... Um, each club needs to upload all their games. I think it's almost in less than 24 hours up to the program and then it's basically accessible to all teams. So you've got the luxury of uh, obviously doing your own games, but then every other game in the league that has been played is now accessible to you. So that's one of the most crucial tools um, when I'm doing it that I know I've got access to. So we might not have even played a team yet, and but there's already... If we're five, six games into the season, there's always five, six games of footage um, of that particular team. Stats like we've talked about is obviously um, an important tool that you can use and utilise. Official stats, again, in any capacity, the numbers don't lie. They're always there and you can always use them to some, in some way or form to assist you in either how you want to develop a game plan, which players you need to narrow down on, um, or things you may need to take into consideration. Obviously, out of wobble, again, Points and fouls, you can utilise that, which is good. SBL, again, you get a list of that. Depending on um, your access to, you can be creative here where I think there's, I don't know if I'm allowed to mention like Hoops DB next year, I'm just going to hope so. You've got third, that basically is Hoops DB, I think it's hoopsdb.com, is basically a third party stats. Um, website who I'm not sure who he is. I think he's involved in the NBL as an assistant coach but either way he's a bit of a rocket scientist and he's already coll he collates off the box scores and does more advanced stats um, even for the SBL level so he does all the state leagues as well as NBL WNBL that's really handy to utilize but there are people out there that are just I don't want to call them freaks, but really invested in, and enamoured with the numbers game and they'll put stuff like that together. And if you have an opportunity to utilise that, then you, you may as well use it. Um, and that's probably more, again, leaning towards a national level where you really take advantage of that. SBO, you can if you're looking to be really indicative about what you want. Um, and otherwise, yeah, you just use the numbers to the best of your advantage. Um, and then probably the other one that's the key one, um, as I said before, just talk to people. Word of mouth is priceless, really. Um, just don't... The basketball community is really small, and if you're an arsehole, people have a tendency to not want to talk to you, which is detrimental to the information that you can pull in. Now, it could be as simple as you build relationships um, with opposition coaches, whether that's having a beer after the game or you just have find an opportunity to have a chat to them. That time is actually really, really crucial because you build those relationships, you'll just have conversations in passing and then you'll probably find you get onto the topic of either a team that you have played or that you have, will be coming up soon and they might drop off, you know, play X, Y, B, torch this, like to always go right, couldn't stop them getting to the basket, wish we made these changes and stuff like that. So that's really important. And you can pick that. That's a form of scouting, believe it or not. It's kind of almost like subconscious scouting a little bit. And just having in those passing conversations um, will help you a lot. So be a nice person, engage with as many people as you can and you'd be surprised. And then in the same time, you'll probably find it will come back in return as well. So they'll probably hit you up at some point. Have you seen, these, have you seen this team play? Have you seen this player play? Uh, and then it's entirely up to you. And then you find you start having these more networks. Now, I would think that at a, especially at a wobble level, that would be really, really important. Um, 
it, and it would just help you on your way. Like I said, you can chat to people and subconsciously they might probably wouldn't even realize that they're giving you information that you can utilize. And it's just about taking that on board um, and making sure you can use that to the best of your ability. Um, all sweet so far. There's no questions. Uh, basically, what would I have? Um, Tim, bro, I what do to have look? A question that's come through. Yep. Just um, in game scouting. So obviously, we have a plethora of assistant coaches, um, and Andrew is the same. He's got a bunch of assistant coaches. So, what sort of things are you looking for in game um, when you're sort of scouting the team on the fly? On the fly. Um, yeah, well, it, again, it, it was, it's sort of, if you need to understand what your coach wants. So if a coach, that, that would be the first question. Like it's when I have, generally before a game, Nixie will kind of give everyone instructions as to what they need to either be looking for monitoring. So that could be something as simple as you take care of the bench uh, for one rep, like Brian, who's in the chat as well, takes care of um, our banks and runs, which is a whole nother topic. And then maybe someone like Corey and myself, you t uh, Corey, take care of the defensive. Timmy, you'll be looking at the offensive side of things. So um, straight away, when I'm looking, say, for instance, if I was looking at an offensively um, for the opposition team, which ball hand are they carrying the ball in? Do they like to penetrate? Would they? How do they play off the ball? Which is quite important. I'm looking at their movement. If they're not involved in the player off the ball, are they working to get open? Do they understand how to, the space around them, and do they utilise that space? Because you find if a player does know how to utilise that, they're the ones that are going to be slipping through gaps, looking to cut over the top, taking advantages of those lapses. Um, how do they handle pressure? Could you throw double hand, double teams at them? What would happen when they do that? Do they pick up the ball? Do they over-dribble it, try to get around it? Do they just look to offload it straight away? And then you can start delving on how your defensive side would work on that. Um, if I was looking at them defensively, basically straight away, are they active? How close do they defend the player? Are they very vocal? Do they work to get in, in position? Um, just all, you know, it doesn't have to be real complex things, just sort of, and body language is obviously very important too um, at both ends of the floor, but particularly defensively. If you get, I think you'll find a lot of the time, it's particularly like imports that come out here, will get, will go like a bat out of hell at the offensive end. They'll come back in defense, but then the way their body language is, is kind of, almost non-responsive, like they don't don't want to do that part of basketball. And if, second, you can see, if you can utilise and see a player like that, I'd probably be like, look, maybe you'd look at attacking that sort of sort of player and utilising that because they're not going to be active on their feet. They're going to be flat-footed and heavy. They're not going to have their hands up. And chances are if you get beaten, they're going to be trying to chop you from behind and so on and so forth. So, yeah, again, it very much revolves around what the coach wants you to do. But then if you do, just look at the little things, always the little things, little intangibles. And I'll touch on that a little bit a little bit later. So I haven't, haven't forgot about that. But, um, but yeah, that's probably what I'll be looking at. That, I hope that answers your question for now. Cool. Um, what I was touching on next is what essentially what to look for um, when scouting. Now, as I said, you need to establish in the scout what you want you want what you want your focus to be essentially so if you're going to sit down um and invest all your time into that scout it would pay to go okay this is what i'm going to be focusing on so i'm going to focus on offense because if you watch sit down and watch a video and kind of don't have a plan in place as to where you would want to go you're just going to find you're watching the game you might be taking notes a few on the offense, a few on the defense, and then this happened and that happened. And it'll just get lost in the mix a little bit. So you need to just zone in and go, I'm going to focus on um, a player scout or a team scout or just pick, just narrow it down. I'll follow this one player for a bit um, or the team aspect. I'll, I'll focus on how this team is playing, what they do in these, how do they run a set, what do they do when they do this. And then I think it'll be a bit more to, easier to control. Now... Um, in a player scout, like, so this is sort of elaborating on what I just touched on. I actually, it was almost what I had up next. Um, I'd be looking at when, if I'm focusing on players, firstly, I would look at straight away is the numbers. So do they average a lot of points, um, or, or rebounds, assists, whatever stat you're looking at. So look at those, where, where do they perform well? Um, are they consistent numbers is, is important. Um, so, you know, you might get 
particular early on, early on in the season, a couple of kids might come out and blaze away in a few games, and then it'll drop. Right, they'll come out and have a couple twenty point games, and then they're throwing up six, eight, eleven points. It doesn't become consistent. So straight away, you kind of like, well, okay, they can fill it up at one time, not so much the next. Are they are they a consistent threat in that regard? Um, what do the teams look like that they played where they got those numbers? Some, again, so you could come back, okay, so they scored 20 points easy, but they were playing more your sort of weaker or bottom feeder teams, but then they was started playing uh, some more top-end tier talent, but they weren't putting up the numbers. Okay, and then straight away, are, they, are these kids or players as good as what we think they are? Um, again, and then I can come back to how, they, how are they getting the numbers? So... Do they, are they getting these from just, you know, they're a gun shooter, they're hitting a lot of triples. Are they big play on the block, getting them, getting the points in the post? Um, do they rebound a lot? So if they're rebounding, how do they get those rebounds? Is it because they're big? Is it because they work super hard? Is it because of their um, positioning? They know, know how to utilize their body. Uh, assists, do they have the ball in their hands a lot? Are they working off ball movement? Is it because they have a high basketball IQ? Um, do they just like to get it and push up the break? And because they're getting ahead of everyone, they've just got opportunities to hit other kids that are running. So then once you start developing that, uh, you can sort of identi start identify how you want to tackle them. Okay, so this kid's getting his assists off pushing the break. Straight away, we've identified that we need to try and slow him down. So you want to, the instruction should really be we need to pick them up Full court, if you want, essentially, immediately stop them, slow them down. Because if you're taking away that fast break run, they can't push in the tempo and then basically rack up these assists, which, is, which you're seeing in the numbers. Um, it can even work defensively if you're looking at, um, say, a player is registering a lot of steals, averaging two, three steals a game. Okay, how are they getting that when you watch footage back? Are they overplaying? Um, do they gamble a lot? Are they just really locked in and focused during tents? Or in some instances, you get players that get the players that get those kind of numbers because they're chopped the shit out of people, and you know they just don't get the calls, so they get away with all the all these token steals. So then, all right, we've got to adjust for that. When you've got the ball, this player's coming at you. You need to be able to protect your body, um, utilize your speed, get around them as quick as you can, so they're on your back foot, and then you know you're putting yourself in a better position to a be in front of the player, and then hopefully if they're chopping and fouling to draw those. Um, unnecessary fouls and then essentially you get them out the game. Um, with players as well, I'd probably be looking at the role in a, in a player's, the player has in that particular team. Are they the best player on a bad team? Um, if they're the best player, do they really, do they carry the load for that team? So they're basically going to have a high ball usage. Um, are they forcing a lot of stuff? So then again, you can understand, all right, if the ball, if a player is going to have the ball in their hands that much, how do we keep the ball out of it? Do we have to front them any time they're on, out in the post? Do we just go really, you know, send one player with them and just deny every catch, make life difficult? You start using that information um, to your advantage. Um, are they, even as much as, are they injured? So you can, you know, again, then that would probably boil more back more to having conversations with people. They might, you know, someone will let you know, hey, this person's carrying an ankle injury or they've hurt a finger or something like that. And not to the point where you would um, attack a person's deficiency by, you know, they've got a bung finger, so I'm going to try and whack them in the hand. But, okay, cool, they're probably not going to carry a hand as much or if they've got a, a gabby ankle, you know, if we try and attack them off the dribble, they're not going to move quite as lateral. Um, and then, you know, you start taking advantage of those things that you've got to work with. Um, and then again, with players that would boil down to player tendencies. So you start really focusing in on what, what is their preferred hand? Do they like to play fast and com or, uh, uh, composed and under control? How do they handle double teams? If you were to throw double teams, how do they play off the pick and roll? Do they come off aggressive, look to hit? Rollers all the time. Do they hit poppers? Can they make that pass? Because um, then that would focus. If a player, if we knew a player couldn't make that pass, cool, we'll just double and get two big people on them, overload and um, you help over to one side, and then basically you can utilise and defend against that. Um, 
how do they act under pressure? And of course, body language for me is one of the most important ones as well. So you can, you'll find out really quickly who wants to be there and who doesn't under pressure just by looking at a player's body language. So watch what they do off the ball. When they don't get involved in a play, do they start dropping their shoulders? Um, if they don't get calls, do they start getting narky and worrying about things? They're the players you want to just attack off that because they're just going to drop their bundle and that stuff, sort of stuff spreads like wildflower. Uh, wildflower, wildfire um, through a team. So if you can utilise that to your advantage, hey, that's great. We're all there to win the game of basketball. And at the end of the day, you shake hands with everyone. But if you can use that in your scout to, to your advantage, then by all means, I, I would definitely do that. Um, I think if you address those sort of key points, what are the numbers? How are they getting the numbers? The role in their team and the sort of tendencies, you should be able to nail down exactly how a player is essentially going to play um, in that game and you should be able to create a game plan um, to tackle that um, more or less. Um, I did have my next one was basically team scouts. So I simply broke that. If I was talking with team scouts, you're looking at an, an offensive analysis, a defensive analysis, and then probably just break it something into intangibles and X factors um, against the team that you're gonna, going to be playing Again, utilise the numbers. It always comes back to numbers. Um, I used to tell my dad all the time, I hate math. And he would reply with, well, math is the world, math is everything. And it's, it's true. Like it always, it always comes back to numbers. And I work a job with numbers and I hate numbers. So I don't know how that panned out. But anyway. Um, so again, a team, points per game, what are they averaging? Does this team get buckets? Are they averaging over 100 points a game? Less than, um, I think... Yeah. Am I mistaken in wobble? You get points for and against on a ladder. Um, yeah, you do. Yeah, be, yeah. That's yeah. really important. That's that's a really important one that you could use, particularly at that level. So, just simply look at the points for who scored the most, and basically rank the, rank the teams and see where you fit in into that mix. Um, obviously, teams that are high scoring, why are they high scoring? Do they have a lot of talented kids? Is it the sets that they run? Um, do they just simply play at a tempo that people can't, can't keep up? Uh, and then look at, more importantly, look at the defensive side as well. So the points against. Now, teams that are, have, obviously have a lower number, uh, they're going to be the better defensive teams. Um, and a team with a higher number is obviously a poor defensive team. So you can utilise that and then, again, see where you fit into the mix with that too. So if you're coming up against a team that's got a really low points, points against, okay, you probably know you're not going to have your way with them. Um, essentially, how why are they such a good defensive team? Do they have tall timber that's packing in the middle? Do they play full court defense all game? Um, how are you going to how are you going to address that and adopt that? So you can come back and utilize those numbers there. Um, probably more an SPL level, you'd start looking at percentages as well. So field goals, what people shooting from the field, three point percentage, and free throws. Can you afford for a team to go to the free throw line? Do they shoot well from the perimeter? Do you need to try and run them off the perimeter? Um, do a lot of their points come in the paint? Like they've got a high field goal, field goal percentage. Okay, this is where their looks are. They're penetrating, getting a lot of easy looks at the basket or penetrating pitch and stuff like that. Um, and then again, you can utilise that to basically work out a team's uh, strengths and weaknesses out of that. Are they high scoring? Do they ha are they poor rebounders because they don't have high rebounding numbers? Are they poor free throw shooters? Do they shoot a lot of threes? We'd probably be looking at the attempts to see if they get a lot up um, there. Uh, offensively, do they run? What plays are they running? So this is where a video would become vital. Um, so you'd literally need to sit down, watch, just watch the team offensive set. Cool. Go down to defense. Don't worry about it. When they come back down, watch again. How are they setting up their offense? What positions are they going to identify? The quicker you can identify the core of their offense, the quicker I think you'll be able to pick it up and basically work your plan. Okay, this is what they're doing. Um, do they run a like? Do they run a, Okay, they're setting out in a motion set. Do they run a flex? Are they coming down playing four out, one in, three out, two in? Um, and then from there, it, you'll find you'll be able to utilize where their looks are coming from. So they'll, all right, they always initiate it by kicking to a wing, having a UCLA cut, and then basically you start to learn their actions. And then once you figure that out, then you can utilize game plan. Okay, when they reverse the ball here, they send a screen, a down pick here, we're going to lock and trail off that, but deny 
overload the split to deny um, a post flash or something like that. So you'll start seeing the repetitions and patterns that come down uh, in that. What do they run um, in their inbound players? So baseline inbounds, sideline inbounds, I would probably be looking at that. How do they set up? Generally, you, you probably only really need to see one example of it. Most teams, you'd probably find, you'd be surprised if they had more than two sort of different sets um, at this point. So generally, you can see, just find the most common one and utilise that. Work out how you're going to defend it. Would it work better if you utilise it in a man or a zone? And then play the best option out of that. Um, Team-wise, screens, how do they handle their on-ball screens? Now, do they like to hit, I touched on it, I think I touched on it just before, do they like to hit rollers coming off? Do they prefer to have bigs that can shoot and prefer to hit pops? Watch a lot of sets of that if you can. How do they play off it? Who's involved with them? Um, is it their good, are they good, have they got a big that likes to score coming off these pick and rolls? Um, is it more a big that's just out there to be the bit, a stereotypical big where they sit, set bone crunching screens and get players open and just happy to sit there and roll. That's something you can take into account as well. Um, and then their tendencies and calls again. So do they push the tempo? Do they slow the game down and play at a composed pace and execute and get through an offense? Um, probably an important thing to utilize on a video if you get or have a luxury of clear audio is what they actually like to call their sets. Um, and then basically when you're um, doing your game plans at that point, then you're able to go, okay, cool. When they yell out three, we know that they're going to kick it to the wing and start doing this and that. And that's a bit more advanced, but it's something that coaches can take into consideration um, when you're planning that component of it there. Um, defensive analysis, again, always come back to your numbers. Have a look at it. Now look at it in a defensive perspective. Do they score a lot? Can they? Are they rebounding? Um, a, a very strong rebounding team. Are they getting a lot of rebounding numbers? Do you need to combat that? Spend a week focusing on your rebounding um, at training. Points against, are teams able to score against this team? Um, if, again, if it's, low, if it's a low number for the points against, chances are that, that they're, they are an adequate defensive team. Um, look at their defensive structures. Okay, do they like to play match-up man majority of the time? Are they prefer to sit back in a zone? Um, I'm guessing that wobble, you probably see a fair bit of zone as well these days. It's sort of, you know, it's a divided opinion as to whether or not zone should or shouldn't be implemented or used a lot. I've found that over probably the last two to three years, it's been quite heavy across all levels that it's sort of making a bit of a strong comeback. Um, but then look at look at this team, how they've been instructed to play their man. Do they get up in your jock strap? Do they sag off their players? Does that enable them? Um, to them deny lanes or are you able to penetrate? Can they defend penetration? How do they rotate? I'd be looking at the rotations. Do pigs get there in time? If a guard gets beat, do they even bother trying to get back into that structure? Um, and just you, how, do, how do they press? Do they press your full court? Do they press in a three-quarter court? Utilise that and then you start thinking about your game plans and alternatives and counters to that sort of information if they are coming coming at you in that regard um zone basically it's probably more about understanding the structure they're doing so again you just watch watch a video or watch out a game if you're able to what what sort of structure do they run are they a typical two three or three two do they do something funky like a one three one and then you start thinking about okay how do we attack that do we look at getting a lot, a lot of zones are broken by entries through the high posts. So do you look at over using that? Do you try and beat it with a lot of ball movement? So getting the ball from side to side, or do you prefer to try and beat it through penetration? If you try and beat it through penetration, understand where the gaps are going to be in their zone when they shift. So I'd basically be looking at how they move when you kick it. Where do they go? Do they get over far enough? Do they stretch not far enough? What's the weak side of the floor looking like? So then you can understand if you've got skip opportunities um, and how you might be able to then att attack off that. So then uh, all other components that you can look at. Um, and then look at how they, obviously defending on balls is very important as well. So offensively, it's good to know what they do, but defensively, it's probably just as important as well. Do they lock and trail and go over the top? Do they always cheat, sag and go under? Do they switch? Um, do they try and ice people out and so to avoid you even using the on-ball screens? Um, look at how they play that. Again, if you know what's coming, then you could create your counters off that. Um, and then I basically had intangibles or X-factor items. 
which could be, it could boil down to as much as a lineup. What what lineups are they playing on the day? Um, just because it's, you know a team's got a bunch of players, they could have injuries. People are unavailable, which could change the dynamic of how a team may play that week. So you need to take that into consideration. Um, who do they start? Who comes off the bench? Do they have players that can come in and fill fill the void? So basically, essentially, nothing drops off uh, during the game. So if you know they take out their best offensive player, who is coming in? Is it someone that's capable of replicating those points? Do you, so do you guard them the same? Do you need to make an adjustment? Sometimes you can change that in game. Um, but if you can sort of preempt that, um, whether or not you've done your scout and spoken to someone, you've read an article, if you're at an SBL level, sometimes they pop that sort of information can pop up. Um, again, you're just utilising all that information to the best of your ability. Then you're probably looking at your matchups as well. So you need to start thinking ahead of, okay, we've preempted the first five or who is available to this team. Who do we think will start? How do we match them up? Who's, who, you know, who's our best defensive player? Do they, do they need, really need to go to their defensive player? Are they able to go to their defensive player? And if not, and then think about all those sort of components and matchups. Are you at a disadvantage with any particular one? You might have, um, you know, your two guards really, sh really a lot shorter than perhaps the person they're going to defend. Do you look at making an adjustment there because they won't be able to carry a hand, or they might get mis there might be a bit of a mismatch in size there, so they might try to look and expose them on the post. Do you look at okay, maybe we'll switch that up and get someone who can handle them on the block a bit more bit more length and stretch the floor and maybe that other that shorter player could more uh, find a more convenient matchup with another player so they're all sort of things you can take um, into account as well probably another intangible is just simply for a team's form so a team irrespective of what you scouted they may just simply be playing super well so you get uh, teams that play really good at the front end of the season and then they drop off or vice versa you get teams that have slow starts to the year but then finish really strongly into the playoffs. Where's that team fit into that into that demographic? Are they playing well just because of the teams they've been playing? Have they got players back? Are they just building chemistry in general, which is probably a big one? That's something you can take into consideration as well because something um, you might look at a player and probably not have thought much of them, but when then when you go back through the numbers, you're seeing that they've started winning games and hang on, this player, although their averages aren't that, High, you know, enough to sort of jolt your interest. But when you start looking, go back and look through them, you're like, okay, they started putting up really good numbers, which is coinciding when this team is playing well. So it's just little things like that you can take out of it um, as well. And then even something as little as um, home and away. Like some teams simply play better at home as opposed to on the road. Uh, you can sometimes break those numbers down as well. Where was this game played? Was it a home game or away? And then you can sort of separate that so even it's something as simple like I come back to the points for and against are they scoring really well how do they score in comparison uh, at home in comparison to the road do they get better defensive numbers at home opposed to the road so you can utilize that um, to the best of your advantage as well is there any questions at the minute um, at all I'll just sort of throw that out there um, so just probably one that I'll ask Tim is just obviously with the SBL um, we have a lot more access to those numbers, the statistics, because there's statisticians at each game. When you're coaching your Division One team, it's it's more related to sort of wobble. Um, what sort of things are you preparing for for Division One, which you think could relate to uh, some of the wobble coaches? Uh, yeah, good question. That's uh, a really hard one. Probably before when I get. <laughs> The, probably the first thing I do when I get to those Divi One games is simply looking at who is playing. Um, it's such you probably don't have that issue quite as much in Wobble, but particularly with Divi One, it's so volatile with who's coming in and out. Um, you know, if a team has players, they're going to play. You know, someone might get promoted to a starting five that week, or some there might even be a double header um, as such. So players. You know, they might just go, look, we're holding out all these players and they'll, have, they'll promote a couple of 16s or 18s to Division One. So straight away, I'm looking at, OK, who's actually available to play? So when I'm getting to the stadium, I'm trying to... I'll, I'll get probably get to the court as quick as I can um, and just basically just have a quick scan around who's, who's there. Do I recognise who is playing, which is quite important? And then I have to start thinking about, OK, is that going to be a problem for the team that I'm going to be putting on the floor? So... 
I'd prob um, probably my main concern is generally always defensively, like how are we going to guard them? I had a very, probably the last two years, real small teams. So I didn't have, I, bigs are a luxury when you start getting to that, that level and you don't always get them, unfortunately. Um, so I need to address how many bigs has this other team got and are they going to be an issue and do I have to change my defensive scheme around it, which a lot of the time I did. So as I said before, I had to play uh, zones becoming more popular and I felt a lot of the time I was actually hard to force the team into that because we do, if we played to a matchup style, they just bomb it inside and then we just had no answer to it. I'd have to send too many doubles um, or we'd, I'd get people in foul trouble and then anyone that was remotely a big, which isn't really a big, is getting in foul trouble and then I'm stuck with five guards on the court, which isn't an ideal scenario. So I'm stuck, I was basically looking at utilising and implementing different sets of zone um, to basically get around... Um, circumnavigate that which I found that to be the most common one big uh, week to week um, and then with guard play it was probably I had to make sure probably didn't have anyone that was overly quick so I'd probably be assessing if anyone had any really quick point guards and how I needed to utilize them if they pushed the floor we needed to just try and stop them straight away now I was happy I was prepared to send double teams early in the backcourt if it meant slowing that person down to give everyone else an opportunity to get back and try and tie up the ball um, so that was a common one. And then, of course, offensively, I had to, okay, is, are the sets that we've got really going to work against the team? Do, I, do we need to look at making sure we move the ball first to penetrate? Um, or basically, can we settle sometimes for early looks if we get them? So I'd be probably be looking at those sort of concepts straight away when I got to that. So very much, who, who, who are you playing? I think if at a wobble level, you've got a luxury of having a pretty good idea who the other team is going to field each week. You probably, the only time it would maybe just as if um, there's going to be an injury to a player or something like that. So, yeah. Oh, defensively, is there anything I need to worry about? Do I need to protect the paint? Is there a guard that I really need to worry about? And then offensively, sort of flip that around and go, okay, cool. How can we attack that? Where are our points going to come from? We're going to be better served sort of moving the ball, getting jumpers and attacking off that? Or do we look to, to exert ourselves and be super aggressive and attack off the dribble real early and look to get a lot of penetration and kick or just try and finish at the rim? So I hope that answers that, that question in that regard. Um, again, okay. So the last one of the last bits I had was what to do with the information that you get. Um, probably the easiest thing to do when you're doing a scout is to over overanalyze things um you can get carried away and i think you'll find once you ever if you ever do do it and you get on a roll you'll end up with four pages of for a better term you end up with four pages of shit and you've got to try and funnel it through to find the good parts that a what you were looking for initially and what what you might be able to get to, to use and utilize that will help you the most so it's trying to find a way to cut cut through all that sort of stuff and just make sure you keep um the good components of that that are going to actually help and assist you so like i touched on earlier help really helps if you know what the coach wants if you know what the coach wants um whether it's a player scout a team scout you're going to you'll be able to narrow it down straight away um if you're going to do it in that front you probably want to try and find maybe just your three best points um so if it's a team scout okay cool we're going to do three of them. well this is what they do these are the three things they do well and then you'll pitch that at the coach, if it's a if it's for a player again, these are the three things they do well. Maybe these are the three deficiencies that they've got. You could list a whole bunch of stuff, especially when you're watching the tape, um, and you you'll just you'll pick up every aspect of what they don't do right or what they don't do well. This is the th these are what I've seen the most, and these are the three things. Pitch them at that, and then try just try and narrow it down a little bit to be nice and clean. Um, how you deliver the breakdown probably. Uh, is important as well. Dissect it into strength and weakness. Oh, that's probably what I should have touched on. Is just dissect it into three strengths and three weaknesses for a bit for a better term. Um, particularly with players, think about um, the matchups that will be presented to you. Which players would be, and start thinking about what players would be best suited for the roles. Um, kind of like who should who should defend who? Do we have a really good adequate matchup for this player? That's what you should recommend. 
um, in that space. And again, if a, if a coach chooses not to utilize that, then that's perfectly fine. You're just trying to del- give them as much information they can to make an educated decision on, on what is coming up. Um, deliver, just don't be afraid to deliver what you think will work offensively and defensively. If you have an sca- have a offensive scheme that you think will work based on the defense, what you've seen the other team um, perform or play defensively, put it forward. That's, that's you know, there's, there's no right or wrongs in basketball and then the it all plays out on the court. So whether or not it's uh, in, I'm trying to think what I was going to put there, but um, yeah, utilize it to just utilize it to the best of your ability. I got lost. People think I want to use it. Okay. And you can draw it on later. So apply again, just apply the knowledge, help develop a game plan. Um, basically, if you've done that scout early enough, you can basically utilize it into your training plans for the week. Um, how are you going to, Assert your, again, comes back to, are you going to exert your game plan or are you going to have a counter game plan um, for that week? So you can basically use that to focus on um, throughout your training sessions. Do we need to work on how we're going to fend on balls because this team's really good coming off on balls? If you've gone to enough um, detail to get their sets, you can run their sets at training, explain to the players, this is how we're going to execute it and run it through. So you're doing it all even prior um, to your game plan uh, and then probably if you have the luxury of video creating snippets so you don't don't overload um, players with too much just basically cut cut it out the bits that you need so you could, again you could limit if you're going to do a player scout for a player take the three offensive points of the player that they'd maybe be playing on here it is so you can deliver it this is when they get their jump shots this is how they create off the dribble this is what they do off the break and you can deliver that. And then hopefully sometimes a lot of players will retain that information as opposed to trying to give them a huge bunch of dialogue um, about what a player does in every situation and scenario. Chances are it's just going to fly over their head. The coach could probably hopefully retain it um, and utilize it when they need to, but a player is going to give them the tidbits and, and feed it to them um, pretty slowly. So that was more or less what I had. Um, Nixie had, I had the scout sheet. That was there. Are you able to bring that up at all? Just the blank one? Cool. Uh, so that's, this is essentially the sheet that I, uh, I would use or anyone at SPL use would use basically every week. Um, I'll just get just a rough description. So obviously you've got all, just all your key basic details at the top. Um, home team, away team, date of the game, um, it, what game is it in the game is generally just list what season it is. Uh, and then the final score would be essentially, um, I will pro- generally in that I would actually fill out what the previous score was if we'd played before. Uh, now, it's got there straight away, what do we expect and what, what do we want? So I'd be looking at, obviously, what do we expect is more from the opposition team that you're going to play. How, how are you interpreting or thinking that they are going to be playing that game? Do you think they're going to come out and be aggressive? Do you think they're going to be lacklustre because they're coming off the back end of a, of a double header? Um, do they play well together? Uh, and so on and so forth. So basically what you're expecting to see from the opposition team, what do we want? I would touch on uh, basically what should our focuses be on the game? Do we need to focus on our rebounding? How we play our defence? Do we need to make sure we're not getting beat middle or um, are we being efficient enough in our offense and th- things like that. Um, then it's broken up into obviously the op- you can try and plan and preempt the opposition starters and then list our starters. Um, so you're aware of who, how the game is going to start essentially. Underneath that, we've got pregame notes, which is for matchups and keys to success. So basically the matchups is pretty self-explanatory. So you take obviously your first five, now, just because it's they're in positions, so you've got your point guards next to your point guard and shooting guard and shooting guard, so on and so forth, does not mean that's how you will match them up. Obviously, you might have your best... The point guard might be the best defensive player in your team and their most um, effective player is the small forward. So you might look at flipping that around and then you alternate your matchups. And obviously, your power forwards and your centres might be alternative and you might find that there's a better matchup that your centre takes the power forward or vice versa or you chop and change that in that space too. So you could list that there. Um, 
keys to success, I would normally would normally narrow it down to three key points um, for the game, and then basically just elaborate on that a little bit more if we needed to. Um, and I'll choose, I've got another example on there, which I will show in a second. Uh, and then basically the next block of the sheet is basically breaking down the scores essentially. So we'd list the opposition scorers, um, I think it was scoring, rebounding, free throws, and then three point shooting. So we'd list the opposition team and our team, and that would be updated every week in terms of how that goes. And that's a handy um, number one to have. Um, probably the rest, they're just points per game. So you can take them straight off the Wobble websites if you need to when you're listing your players. Um, the free throws and the three point shooting, I would actually probably look at their attempts as opposed to the percentages. So I would list uh, whoever's taking, so for free throws, for instance, on a team, whoever's taken the most free throws, I would list that number one. And then they're obviously their associated percentage next to that. The second, whoever's taken the second most, second, third, fourth, because they're the people that are going to be impacting the game. Whereas you don't want to list it who shot 100% and it's a player, a role player that might come in and play, you know, has shot one free throw of the season and shooting 100%. So it doesn't quite give you a true reflection. Um, and you do the same for your three point percentage as well. Who's taking all, who's, who is taking all the shots? Okay, they're taking what? Do they shoot a good clip? Yes or no? So you can work that off uh, out off of that. The last component there would be notables um, and pretty much I would list generally in there any sort of team scout aspect that I wouldn't have touched on um, ahead of that, how do that, maybe how they run a particular set, um, what they like to do out of a timeout or something, how, what side line out of bounds play they would maybe run out of a timeout, what do they do after a free throw and then individual scouts, um, I would list all that off there. So I'd go through probably the five, yeah, Five starters are a lock, um, and then maybe you delve into the sixth, seventh player. Um, if you're really getting invested or they're a really deep team, you can look at going further, but then that's obviously depends on how much time's available to you. So um, I also sent Nixie a copy of a completed one that had, we had done during the year, which was for Co uh, Coburn that we played during the year. So that's just an example of basically what has been written up there. So obviously, all your basic. Um, components are filled out. Now we've said, what do we expect from there? So some structure, but chaotic for most, revolve heavily around Keisha Lee, who was um, basically their key, key or restricted player and no identity right now. So we're playing them early in the season. They hadn't won a lot of games um, and most of their, you know, they were in some games, but then they'd get blown out. So they were kind of really struggling with what, how they were sort of wanted to play as a team. So we kind of, Went in with the fact that after watching a video that we you kind of you're not sure what to expect out of a team like that, so it's almost like expect the unexpected um, a little bit. What do we want? We basically said that game we needed consistent and constant pressure, um, composure throughout, and to play at our pace. So don't get again if you're playing a team that's unexpected, that, that can um, affect the ebb and flows of the game. So you need to be overly cautious about how you want to play the game and make sure you exert that as well. Um, and then let the defense drive the offense. So we're basically working that game on getting stops and then basically pushing and playing a pace out of that. Um, that would suit that would suit us. Um, starters are listed there. So we had obviously the, it's the projected lineups at the time. Um, if you had information or knew someone was out, you would try and make the, um, the assumption as to who would come into that lineup. Um, I don't think... No, so we see we had a change there in the matchups. So initially in the, in the point guards, they were all saying Roberts... Who was it? No, Ruby Ben and Michaela Perini were our point guards, whereas Mick was a little slower, so we probably didn't want her um, guarding, Ruby, guarding Ruby Ben. So we put Chelsea on her, and then Mick um, would take Nicole Roberts out of that. So that's just an example of how your lineups can chop and change out of that. Uh, keys to success, we said there, obviously, an important one was value possession, uh, and just elaborate. On that, okay, why, why do we need to value possession? Because when we do that, we play very well, very simplistic. Um, and then at the time when we were doing that, we were getting some, playing some really good basketball in forms of that wood structure. We get good looks because we get some ball movement um, and we're basically filling the positions and spots we needed within our structure of the offense. Uh, rebound and push. So we'd identified that basically if we're rebounding the ball and getting it out nice and quick, um, in our obviously particularly with our transition details, uh, that would be in a good position to get a lot of easy buckets. They weren't 
a very good defensive team at the time. So if you can utilize that to your advantage where they're not going to really work hard to get back, and if you're working double time in offense straight off, straight away, not giving them an, an opportunity to set or slow the ball, then we're in a good spot. Um, and then we just touched on Lancelot sat both ends, which was probably more focusing on how we were carrying ourselves and how we needed to play the game. So just basically making sure that there are, you try and minimize your lapses, um, you know, so we're not having lapses in defense where they sort of get on a run um, or hit three buckets in a row against us. We're keeping them essentially to one look, you know, take the rebound, and then we're pushing play to that. Offensively, no breaks off. Everyone's executing. We're getting to the spots we need to be. Everyone's being a threat. Um, get to be, and basically penetrate, pitch, make sure you're in your receiver positions out of that. Um, and you can see we've utilized the numbers there. So you can see Keisha Lee was their top scorer. Two, three, four, five lists out of that. After you had take Keisha Lee and Tilly Muir out of that, they didn't really have a lot to offer offensively. So straight away we're looking at that. Okay, cool. If we can stop Keisha Lee and Tilly Muir, these guys are probably going to have a really hard time putting points on the board because there's sort of not really anyone left to fill the void. Um, Rebounders there, you can see Vanessa Michael, Jody Sante, and then it was sort of they just sort of featured around that mark, but no, had no prolific deep uh, rebounders. Whereas you see on the other side, we've got had like Kayla Sandal averaging double figure boards, and Amber Land, who's a, who's a beast as well. Um, free throws, so we utilize out of that. So again, Tilly Muir was taking their most free throws. So you had okay, how is she? How is she getting to the line? Um, is she? Is it because she's being all right? She's obviously being aggressive at the basket, but is she getting them? off the block and squaring up? Is she catching them off the perimeter because she's is basically a bit of a stretch four? So she had the opportunity to basically try and take bigger, bigger players off the perimeter and might be working off the dribble. So you start identifying, looking at, okay, why, why is she getting all these free throws and how is she getting them? Uh, Ruby Ben and then Keisha Lean, you can see their associated percentages. And then three-point shooters, who's taking those shots? Keisha Lee's not shy to get them up, but 38% clip is actually pretty solid. Um, but then you see after that, you've got like a Haley D'Souza who's taken 24 shots but only landed five throughout the season at that point. So you'd probably be kind of content if it's one of those players take, taking those. Um, and that's where you want to try and force force the play to go as the play uh, developed in that game. Uh, in the notables there, so again, I just said, got there on their horn set, they like to double away, similar to our thumb. So basically they'd come off that and then duck when the player comes off, they would go double away, probably somewhere in the corner from memory. Um, and then they sag off. The defenders like to sag off. So it's just a more sort of notable and intangible. So if their players are sagging off, we're probably going to get opportunities to get a couple of shots off or we're looking at basically a trade off that because they're not, they're not going to be in a position to defend when we've got, um, you know, you've got your Izzy Miotis, Georgia Dennehy's on our team who are really, really quick. Um, and then basically from there, I've basically just developed um, uh, scout for each individual player so all the starters are there um, and you can sort of you put that in a way or description that suits you best like there's again there's no right or wrong I'll sometimes maybe throw a joke in there to make sure Nixie's actually reading the scouts um, which you'll generally pick up on most of the time but be, con be constructive with it too and you just put in what you can so you can you know, as much, inf you know, inf knowledge is power. So the more you got in there, the better for a coach. But you would never want to present that documentation to a player because it's just way too, way, way, way too much. And they'll read aspects of it. They'll overthink it. Um, and then you've got them thinking about the wrong things because they might read and interpret something that's important to them when it's not really what you want them to probably be focusing on. So if you're going to share or utilize that, you'd maybe take one section or particularly with the player scout, if you understand or know that they're going to be defending that player, cool, cut that out, have that. It's not too much. They're focusing on that, on that player only. And then the rest is up for the coach to utilize. So um, that was more or less what I had, Nixie. So I was hoping to get to half an hour's worth and I think I've just made it. So um, yeah, if anyone has any questions, like open book and um, by any means please ask you've gone a whole hour mate um, <laughs> um, Andrew did have a question <laughs> and I will ask it because uh, I know he's being funny but he goes uh, why aren't you the women's head coach mate hey why aren't you the women's head coach 
I don't know. I can't. My my head's not as bald yet, so I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, mate. I think that's a ticket of approval from Andrew. So that's a positive. Does anyone else have any uh, questions um, at all for for Tim? Uh, Chris, yeah, I'll unmute you, mate, and you can fire away. Um, you might have to do it yourself, actually, Chris. It's not. Oh, now here we go. We're there. Oh, try again. Almost had it. Can everyone hear me? Yeah, got you. He's now. on. All right, cool. Um, yeah, obviously you're talking about um, obviously you're watching film of a game uh, or of a team. Sorry for their last two or three games. You get an idea of their style of play and their sets that they're doing, um, offensively and defensively. Um, is it common at your at an SBL level for teams just to come out of the blue and come up with random new offensive plays, new inbound plays, new defensive sets? Um, and then how, what do you guys do to, to sort of correct that on the, on the day? Yep. No, that could 100% that can happen. I think you'll probably find that that's more indicative of happening um, later on in the season. So uh, particularly around um, playoff times, like I know we do, we do that as well. So you'll run all your stuff during the regular season and you probably will keep a couple of sets and stuff on the back burner. Like, okay, we'll change our um, inbound sets or we'll have a couple of, minor tweaks to our offense and what we typically do or some in some instances but yeah like you said people will actually introduce something completely different um but if it happens again it's just it's on the fly and you're kind of really relying all right you have to go back to trusting the systems that you've implemented so your defensive philosophies and your offensive philosophy you've got to kind of hope that they really sort of shine through in a little bit so if your rule is to never give up middle irrespective of what set they've done they don't give up middle whatever was instructed on your on-ball set, if you've said, all right, we're going under everything, you make sure they do that under. So when the other team produces something different, you're not, you know, why are we switching? Why are you going over the top? That wasn't the instruction as long as you stick with that. And then if you get beat on that, you get beat on that. That's just the reality of basketball and probably what everyone's trying to achieve anyway. Um, but in those sort of instances when things drop like that that you didn't account for, which can happen very much... I would say you heavily rely on your your players a to understand what's happening and how to how to overcome that on the fly. But also you need to make sure that you rely on your system and what you have implemented um, is sort of suitable for any any type of situation. I guess you could say so. You know because you can't you can't address everything as much as you want to, but you just need to make sure your fallbacks and your baseline will, will hopefully keep you covered in most scenarios. I mean, Andrew's actually going to add on to that. Um, so I'm just going to unmute him. So. Oh, yeah, sorry, Tim. I was just, when Chris asked that question, it made me think of something because I've been asked it before. Um, and then I do actually have a question I want to ask you as well. But um, Chris, I was just going to say, when I do it, and it's only just my opinion, um, we don't, I don't teach our players how to guard specific sets. Uh, what we do is how, we focus on how to guard concepts. So it doesn't matter what set a ball screen is. As long as we know how we're guarding ball screens, it doesn't matter when it comes in. Um, and like Timmy was saying with his personnel, as lo if we know that we're always going to front number 10 on the post, it doesn't matter in what set, that's always going to be the rule. So I think if you're coaching juniors, instead of trying to understand how to guard 35 different sets, whatever it might be, if you know how to guard concepts, then it doesn't matter in what pattern they arrive as long as you know how to guard the concept, if that makes sense. So um, but my question for you, Tim, was just um, about coaching juniors. Um, obviously, if you're coaching under 12s or 14s, you're probably not going to go into too much detail with the information you give them. If there was probably three main things you would talk about the opposition, what, what would those focus points be for your scout? Um, for juniors, yeah. If I'm so Are you talking offensively or defensively, or it doesn't really matter? Yeah, it probably doesn't even matter. I mean, if you were just to pick, because obviously you're not going to deliver, um, you know, all that statistical information because A, you don't have access to it, but B, they it would go over their heads. If there was probably just the three most important things that you'd focus on when you were scouting an opposition, what, what would they be? Yep, um, probably just determine, like, okay, I'd probably keep it super simple, like, Pretty much essentially what you just sort of touched on. So if there's a big in the, in the pot, not like you, at that level, you'd say to front them. Um, but say, for instance, you've got, to, you've got a guard, you know they're going to carry the ball and they're going to push the ball. Okay, all we've got to do is just stay in front. You don't have to reach off and help and 
basically chop and change or, you know, playing the structure of the defense, just make sure you stay in front of them. Keep, I'd probably just keep the instructions super simple. Um, you know, if it, stay in front, cool. If, this is, if that player plays off the wing, we know they're a threat. All right, we'll just, we want to deny, deny the shit out of them, essentially. So make sure you get, work on their stance. Okay, they're going to look to, maybe one instance where they'll say, look, they like to go to the baseline. When they get to the baseline, they ping off. That's when you need to be prepared. So just make, they'll probably map more emphasize on their timing of things, when to expect it. And I think if you can sort of develop on that sort of in, instinctual component of it, I think would probably be what I would look at with juniors more. So, okay, this is when you need to jump into the lane when that player is trying to get open. So then they understand, okay, cool. So when I'm, if they're two passes away, fine, we don't need to now that they're one pass. Like it's all typical stuff, but just emphasize it, probably just emphasize the basics a little bit more. So now you need to be really particular to deny that player the ball. When someone's cutting, look, we want to lock and trail over the top. Don't cheat because you'll probably find a lot of kids will either run and then release and try and go under or do something. Just reiterate, look, they go with that. If you stay over the top, then we've got help help rules in place they'll keep you covered but do your job lock and trail and try and stay in tight tight with them as you can um and offensively it would probably be similar concepts not making sure they understand knowing when to cut look this defensive player is going to sag right off you if you think you've got a shot be confident and, and take the shot so simplify if they're playing right up in you make sure you work hard Use your scissor hand cuts, work to get open. Then when you've got open, be really strong with the ball and just look to get past them because they're going to be on your hip. So, yeah, I'd be looking at just utilising just simple, basic tools. And people, I think people overlook simple, basic things at the best of times, and particularly juniors. As long as you're focusing with that, I think they'll, it'll help develop their IQ. But then when you work on their basic and simple stuff when they get to higher levels, once you got that base, then they can start concentrating on the more complex examples.